Daniel chapter 2, beginning in verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest and beheld a great image. This great image, whose splendor was extraordinary, stood before thee, and the form thereof was awesome. By the way, I'm reading from the KJV, but I, I changed some words here and there just to make it a little bit more understandable for those of us in 2020. This image's head was of gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, clay, brass, silver, the gold broken pieces together and became like the shaft on the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, and no place was found for them. And that stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the earth. This is the dream, and we will tell you the interpretation thereof, O king. Jump down to verse 42, just for the final part of it. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, uh, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Verse 44, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God hath made known to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, what shall come to pass hereafter. The dream is absolutely certain, and the interpretation thereof is also dead on accurate. May the Lord add His blessing to the reading of the Word of God. I thought I would go through a series, and I don't know how that's going to work. As Dan and I share the pulpit, I may preach two or three Sundays in a row, or we may alternate Sundays. We'll just see how the Lord leads. But I am going to do a series uh, beginning today uh, that deals with the big picture of eschatology and what we're dealing with today. In fact, today's focus is going to be simply this, one of the signs of the end times, the rise of global government. Well, as we've dealt with this virus emanating from Wuhan, China and sweeping the world, I've seen a lot of discussion between individuals both online and in person about eschatology and how this virus may fit in concerning end times. Well, is this part of the tribulation? Is it leading up to the tribulation and whatever? Well, this morning I hope to begin, as I said a moment ago, what for my part will be a series. History is sometimes called His story. As we see the pages of the Bible unfold and as we see events take place in the world, understand, ladies and gentlemen, that it is all about Jesus. It is His story. And notice in the Bible that there is perfect symmetry. It begins in Genesis with the first Adam and his bride walking in the presence of God, living in paradise. And it ends in Revelation 21 and 22 with the second Adam and his bride living in the paradise of a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. Folks, understand that when God created Adam, he didn't create man as a robot. We aren't forced to love Him, and you can't be forced to love someone. Love is a decision. Love is a choice. And it's amazing as God has worked out this creation and this life, when we get to the new heaven and the new earth, everyone that is there will have chosen to be there. God simply created Adam. He simply created Eve. They didn't have a choice, but as things progressed, all men are sinners. Christ died for our sins. He offers to us eternal life through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, His shed blood. 
And it's up to us to decide whether we're going to bend our knees and trust God or not. John 3, 18 says this. Jesus, as talking to Nicodemus, said, Whosoever shall believe in me is not condemned, but whosoever believes not is condemned already because they've not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So understand, whereas Adam and Eve were created, didn't have a choice in the matter, the bride in eternity will have all chosen to submit to God's will, serve Jesus, and we will be there by choice. That is a perfect eternity. Now, eschatology, by definition, means the study of last, in this case, the last days. And to understand Bible prophecy, you must understand Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and Daniel 9. Also recognize that there are certain rules of Bible study. The Bible is a progressive revelation that must be read from left to right. Ladies and gentlemen, truth is built one brick on another, just like courses built in a brick wall. Number two, as you study the Bible, always read the passage in context. That's why I take so much time to give the background of the studies that I give. These conversations, these verses, these truths stated didn't just happen in a vacuum. Why were they being said? To whom were they being said? Under what conditions? What were they talking about? And what did the people already understand? And what were they expecting? Then point three, remember to study the Bible from a Jewish context. We have created countless denominations over subjects that to the Jewish mind wasn't even a question. Take baptism, for example. You talk to a Jew in, in the time of, of 30 A.D., there was no question what baptism was or what it meant. But you try to reinterpret things 1,600, 1,700 years later, and you forget your Jewish history, then you can come all over the place with your conclusions. Remember that the Bible is a Jewish book written by Jewish authors to a largely Jewish audience about the Jewish Messiah who also happens to be the creator of the universe and the savior of all mankind. Now, as we take time to study what the Bible has to say about these last days, we'll make and record various observations as we discover them, and we'll keep track of what we discover, compiling the facts in a list, and we'll compile a summary as we go along. And let me assure you, yes, I do have preconceived understandings about the Bible. This is not my first time to have done a study on eschatology. This is not my first time to have read the Bible, but I have been very disciplined, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen as a pastor. I recognize that James says that as a teacher of the Word of God, I am going to give an account for how I teach and what I teach one day. I want you to know I'm not worthy of this job. And that, that, that right there scares me to death. So I make very clear what my opinions are and what is unquestionable from the Word of God. And I always encourage you to be uh, followers of Acts 17, 11. I want you to be Bereans in your study. I want you to listen closely to me. I want you to take notes because I promise you, I put in a lot of study when I put these messages, these lessons together. But then I want you to get in the Bible and check me out and make sure I'm right. And understand, I don't want to win a debate with some mid-trib rapture guy or post-trib rapture guy. I'm not trying to win the argument. I want to make sure that I'm right. My eternity depends on it as well as yours. So as I go through the Scripture, yeah, I've got some preconceived ideas. But as I go through the Scripture, I try to wipe the board clean and see in context what exactly is the Word of God saying. So trust me as we do that, but don't trust me and check me out with Acts 17, 11 and make sure that I am absolutely correct. Well, let's begin with a little bit of background. Of course, it was about 350 years after the time of the flood, and once again, amazingly, the world had forgotten about God. Ladies and gentlemen, would you believe, I'm sure Dan has probably covered this uh, already in the Bible lessons on Sunday morning, would you believe that Noah was still alive? As a matter of fact, Abraham was 58 before Noah died. 
you would think that there would have been some obvious revelation of the truth to that generation. But amazingly, in less than four centuries, the world had again turned its back on God. But this time, instead of judging the planet, God reached into a city called Ur in the middle of Chaldea and called out a man originally named Avram. We know him as Abraham and said, I am going to make of you a great nation. As a matter of fact, the Messiah is going to come through your lineage. And one day, the Messiah through this nation is going to rule and reign over planet earth. But first, your descendants are going to spend some 400 years in bondage. In fact, that's exactly what happened. Following Joseph, the 70 original members of the family of Jacob moved into Egypt some 400 years later after they had forgotten about Joseph and had enslaved the people. That group of 70 grew to some 2 million. And then God brought them out with a mighty hand miraculously. You know what? I grew up a Baptist. I was taught all the stories of the Bible, but never was taught where they fit together. That's one of the reasons I like to do all the background and kind of show you. Hey, they came out of Egypt miraculously. I believe they crossed this path. There are different theories, but I believe they crossed the Red Sea right here. By the way, there are some people that try to make these explanations and say it wasn't really the Red Sea. That would have been impossible. That would have taken a miracle. It was really the Reed Sea. It was just a marsh that was about 18 inches deep, and that's what they passed through. I don't know, folks. To me, that's still a miracle. Amazingly, 18 inches of water destroyed the entire Egyptian army. <laughs> but folks, understand, this is not about natural answers. These are supernatural, miraculous occasions. And if you can believe Genesis 1-1, that out of nothing, an eternal God spoke everything into existence. If you can believe that, then every other miracle in the Bible should be a given including, and most importantly, the fact that Jesus literally died, was placed in a tomb for three days, and then was alive again three days later. Folks, that's not natural. That is supernatural. That is a miracle. And that is the basis and cornerstone of our Christianity. But it took them some 50 days, and then they were finally here. As a matter of fact, we don't even know for how long they were at Mount Sinai. By the way, Sinai is not here. Sinai is in Arabia, according to Paul's writing in Galatians. There is a mountain there that fits all the criteria, including evidences of a great group of Hebrew people that had been there at one time. But they spent roughly one year here at Mount Sinai. Moses went up and down the mountain, conferring with God, getting the law, getting the architectural plans for the tabernacle, and all the instructions for the priesthood. They were here almost a year before they broke camp and then headed to Kadesh Barnea where they sent in the 12 spies that searched out of the promised land for 40 days. And they came back and said, listen, it's everything God said. It is a land of milk and honey, but there are great fortified cities in the land and there are giants in the land. Folks, that wasn't a figure of speech. That wasn't saying, hey, they're big, strong people. There were giants in the land. Think of Goliath at nine and a half feet tall. There were giants in the land. They said, we can't go in and take them. So by a committee, vote of 10 to 2. And that's why I'm not a big fan of committees. They say a camel was a horse put together by committee. You'll get that on your way home. But they had a committee of 12 and they voted 10 to 2 not to trust God. And God said, I've had it with you. I'm going to keep my promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but this generation's not going to enjoy them. Your children will. And they wandered for 40 days before they came back and, of course, then entered into the promised land after Joshua led them in. But Israel, uh, they were called to be a kingdom of priests of the Most High God. And according to Isaiah and the other prophets, they were to be a lighthouse spreading the truth to all the Gentile nations. Remember, Jesus said the week before his crucifixion, hey, you've turned my house into a den of thieves, but my house is to be a house of prayer for the Jews? No, for all nations. God spoke to the Jews and through the Jews, gave them the word of God, and the nation of Israel was supposed to be a kingdom of priests, drawing the Gentile world under the truth of Jehovah. But unfortunately, they didn't. They largely apostatized. They were attracted by the sin of the Gentile nations around them. And God sent prophets to try to get their attention. Uh, men like Elijah and like Elisha. And God sent famines to try to get their attention. And plagues, as we 
we are dealing with this coronavirus and military invasions all trying to get their attention, but for the better part of time, they were disobedient. Now, there were times where they were obedient. They had good, righteous judges, or in the latter times, good, righteous kings, but largely they apostatized and followed after idolatry. Now, the first 400 years, they were was a period called the judges, as recorded in Judges, and they didn't have a king. And quite frankly, God's design for government was to not have a king. It really, Israel operated under a constitutional republic of 12 states. They had 12 states, each with their own leadership. And they were to choose out from among themselves capable men that loved truth, feared God, and hated covetousness. And they were to judge according to their constitution, which was the Torah the rule of law, and they were to judge righteously, not showing favoritism towards anyone because we're, uh, we're all equal under the eyes of God and under the law. But they didn't. They forgot the law. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes, and anarchy developed. So they said, we know what we need. We don't need revival. We need a stronger government to take care of all of our problems. Boy, isn't that a good idea? No, it's not. But they said, we need a king. And God said, that's not a good idea. You're not going to like it. He spoke through Samuel. But they said, no, we want to be just like the other nations. We want a king like everybody else had. And God gave them a man that was attracted to them, Saul. But Saul was self-willed. Then God chose a man that he was pleased with, David, who reigned for the next 40 years, and said, he promised through David that one of these days out of your lineage, there's going to be a king from your loins that is going to rule and reign in righteousness forever. We know that that is the promised Messiah, and we know him as Jesus. But after 120 years, after David's son Solomon had reigned, and Solomon, in the midst of all of his prosperity, started out very righteous but ended up an idolater, God said enough, and he divided the kingdom into two parts geographically, ten tribes geographically to the north and two tribes geographically to the south. The north immediately followed idolatry built golden calves and worshiped them. The south initially was righteous and went back and forth between good kings and bad kings. After a period of 250 years approximately, the northern king was captured by Assyria. You would have thought that that would have gotten Judah's attention and they would have fallen on their face and said, hey, we're not going to make that same mistake, but it didn't. It only took about another century until they were captured. In all, Israel was in the promised land for about 800 years. Think about it, about three times longer than America has been in existence. Israel was in the promised land, and now God punished them for their disobedience and took them out of the land. Now, there were three famous prophets who were all contemporaries ministering at largely the same time. Jeremiah, who was the older and senior of the three prophets, ministered in Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, it is likely that Ezekiel and Daniel, when you consider their families and where they lived, would have heard Jeremiah preach his temple discourses when they were at the temple as teenagers. But Jeremiah ministered in Jerusalem. Ezekiel was a priest or of the tribe of priests. He wound up being taken captive and ministered to a Jewish refugee city called Tel Aviv, the Mount of Springs. By the way, it is from this city that Tel Aviv in modern Israel is named. But he ministered among the Jews in, the, as, in this refugee city called Tel Aviv. And then you had Daniel who was a key advisor to Nebuchadnezzar, and he served in the capital as Babylon ruled the known world. Now, because of their disobedience, God revealed to Jeremiah that they would be in bondage for 70 years. But God assured them that at the end of that period of judgment, they would be back in their land, literally, as one nation. Ezekiel had two famous visions. He said this in Ezekiel 37, the valley of dry bones. These bones are the whole, represent the whole house of Israel. Let me ask you this. Are there any lost tribes? No. It says the whole house of Israel will be back in, the, in Israel and bring you into Haaretz. 
the land of Israel. And I shall place you in your own land, and then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. And then after this, he had the valley of the two sticks that Ezekiel put in his hand, and they appeared as one. And God gave him this testimony. I will take the children of Israel from among the Gentiles and bring them into their own land, and I will make them one nation, no longer two, Israel and Judah, no longer ten tribes and two tribes, going to be one nation in the land, the promised land of Israel, upon the mountains of Israel, and they're going to have one king. Be one king to all of them. There shall no more be two nations, neither shall be divided into two kingdoms at all anymore. And the prophet Isaiah told us about the coming king of the final kingdom. He said, His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and the government shall rest upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and the peace that shall come of it, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon David's kingdom to order it and to establish it with justice and judgment from henceforth even forever. Trust me, God says, I'm going to keep my word. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Folks, let me just ask you a question. Was David's kingdom literal or theoretical? Where was David the king over? Heaven? No. He was the king over the promised land of Israel. Where was David's throne in heaven? Jerusalem. Folks, this says that the Messiah is literally going to rule and reign, literal terra firma, from Jerusalem. In fact, if you were to go look in Luke chapter 1, when you see that Gabriel appeared unto Miriam and said she was going to give birth to a miracle baby, even though she was still a virgin, the statement was made there that he would rule and reign from the throne of his father David. That was speaking of uh, King Jesus. Now, for a Jew... Understand, that's what we're looking at. In context, for a Jew, the next thing on the timeline, as we see Jeremiah ministering, as we see Ezekiel ministering, as we see Daniel ministering, as we see Israel out of the land in captivity, the next thing on the timeline was their return and the coming of their king, the Messiah. Now, Daniel, as an advisor to Nebuchadnezzar, he was part of the, the Magi. You've heard that term. Daniel shot to stardom as he interpreted a dream that had been given to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2. Most of you are probably familiar with this dream. Now understand what was going on. Nebuchadnezzar is now in charge. He had been the top general for his father, Nebuchadnezzar, who had been the king of the empire of Babylon. Now Nebuchadnezzar is in charge. He had inherited all of his father's advisors or magistrates or magi. And he had this dream. It really shook him up. He didn't know what it meant. And he said, I got to know what this dream means. Obviously, it has to mean something. So he called his advisors and said, man, I need you to tell me what th this dream means. Now, remember, they hadn't been selected by him. They had worked for his father. He didn't know if he could trust him or not. So he said, tell me what my dream said. They said, sure, your highness. Uh, tell us your dream, and we will interpret it for you. He said, no, I've been to the Oklahoma State Fair before. I've seen those palm readers. I know that trick. I want you, since you as Chaldeans and Magi supposedly have a connection to the gods, well, then you should be able to commune with the gods and find out what my dream was. And if you tell me what my dream was, then I'll know you, you can tell me what it meant. And they said, how are we supposed to know what your dream was? Uh, somebody would have to be able to commune with the gods to know that, uh-oh, they just exposed themselves as being fraud. He said, listen, if you don't tell me what my dream is, I'm going, to destroy, I'm going to kill your family. I'm going to tear down your houses. Well, that didn't go over well. It wasn't a popular day to be a, a member of the Magi. And they were going through, and they came and knocked on Daniel's door since Daniel was a member of the Magi. And the sheriff was there and said, sorry, Daniel, we're going to have, you haven't been social distancing. We're going to have to arrest you. And Daniel said, wait a minute, what do you mean you're going to kill us for this? We haven't had a chance. Give us a chance. So they got 24 hours, and Daniel and his buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, got on their knees and asked God for, for an explanation of that dream. And God came through and gave them the dream and the explanation. Daniel gave Nebuchadnezzar the dream. Nebuchadnezzar said, that is spot on. I trust that you can tell me what it means. 
And Daniel shot to stardom when he explained what this dream means, this vision of this image with a head of gold, arms of silver, a belly uh, and thighs of brass, legs of iron, and feet and ten toes of iron mixed with miry clay. Folks, this was a revelation of God's snapshot of history. This period of time began with Jerusalem's conquest by the Gentile world ruler Nebuchadnezzar, and it ends when God reestablishes His rule, His kingdom of heaven on this earth through Israel and through the promised Messiah on the throne of David in Jerusalem. Now, folks, if you literally believe in plain teaching in the Bible, then you must believe that, that this will, in fact, literally happen. And I don't know how you can take God's dealing with Israel so literally to this point and then suddenly believe that Israel doesn't really mean Israel, that Israel now means the church, and that the promised land doesn't really mean the promised land, that the promised land now means heaven. I just don't think you can make that change in the middle of the stream and be consistent. However, that's not the point of the message today. That was just a, a, an editorial statement made in passing. Now, this period of time... It's called the times of the Gentiles. What a brilliant name. What does it mean? It means the time period in which Israel and Jerusalem would be under foot of Gentile control. Makes sense, doesn't it? The times of the Gentiles. Now, there were five Gentile powers identified with the first four of these kingdoms defined in the Bible. First, that head of gold was Babylon as defined in Daniel 2.38. Second, that arms of, of silver was Media Persia as defined in Daniel 8.20. Third was Greece as defined in Daniel 8.21. The fourth was the Roman Empire, as defined in Revelation 17.10. And the last, the fifth, has not been defined. But we know it is a confederation of ten kings that will be ruling the world in the last days when, while they are in charge, they will be destroyed, and an eternal kingdom of heaven will be established through Israel with the Messiah ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. Now, even with this image and revelation, Daniel is still assuming 70 years, which is what Jeremiah had said. So Daniel naturally concludes that these five Gentile powers will all come and go over a period of 70 years with the restoration of Israel and the Messiah as king. Is that fair, everything I've said so far? Does, everybody, does that make sense? Is everybody still in agreement? So now we fast forward from Daniel 2 to Daniel 9. Approximately 68 years have passed. Daniel is now an old man. But of the prophesied Gentile kingdoms, they were barely into the reign of the second Gentile power, which was Media Persia. And Daniel was perplexed. And he said, what's going on, Lord? Have you changed your mind? Have mercy on us. And he said this in the first year of Darius, of the seed of the Medes, when he was king, I, Daniel, I understood by reading the book of Jeremiah that he was going to accomplish the desolation of Israel and Jerusalem for a period of 70 years. And as he concluded, it wasn't working out. Has God changed his mind? He said, Lord, we don't deserve it, but God, your name's on the line. Your reputation's on the line. For the sake of, of your righteousness, not ours, for your mercy's sake, oh, Lord, please hear our prayers. And God sent an angel to give him the answer. And the answer was this, that their judgment had been multiplied by seven in accordance Leviticus 26. God had said, when I punish you, take it, humble yourselves, and move on. But if you rebel even after I've punished you, by the way, I remember my mom telling me when I was a teenager getting one of my last spankings, and by the way, she did her very best to beat the devil out of me. I'm not sure she succeeded entirely. But she said, if you fight me, you'll just make it worse. Because she was going to keep swinging that belt 
until she, I agreed with her. Israel had been taken captive, and God told them, hey, there had been a period of time in history through the times of Judges where God had sent a Samson or God had sent a Gideon to deliver them out of captivity. Not this case. And he told them through Jeremiah. He said, listen, you're going to be out of the land for 70 years. There's no arguing with it. That's the, that's the amount of time you're grounded. Just deal with it and don't try to fight me. But they did. They tried to rebel after about 10 years. And Nebuchadnezzar had to come back down and settle them down. And then about 10 years later, they tried to rebel again. And this time, Nebuchadnezzar came down and destroyed the city and destroyed the temple and everything else. But here's what happened in the process. Hey, God says, I'm going to break you of your pride. I'm going to break you of your pride. I'm going to multiply your sin times seven. That's what happens. Rather than 70 years, their judgment was now multiplied. It says this, it was now 70 times seven has been determined by the judge on Israel until the kingdom is restored. So Israel is going to be punished for the disobedience. All prophecies were going to be fulfilled. Hey, 70 weeks are determined upon the church. No, upon thy people, Daniel, and upon thy holy city, Jerusalem. For what? To finish your transgression, to, to pay for your transgression, which was just outright disobedience, to make an end uh, to just, justification for your multitude of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to finish all the visions and the prophecies, bring them to an end, and to anoint the most holy one, the Messiah, in the most holy place. 490 years, and it's going to be done. God gave Daniel a timeline. And that timeline began with a promised future command to return and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. So ladies and gentlemen, for those of you that are Bible students, you know that this was not Zerubbabel's initial return under Cyrus, where about 50,000 Jews went back and initially started to resettle the promised land. This was not the time when the priest Ezra went back to lead a revival in the priesthood. This was very specific. This prophetic clock of God's dealing with Israel would begin ticking when Nehemiah, the cupbearer, returned to rebuild the city and the walls of the city. It was at that point in time, after uh, this, a certain period of time, as the clock was ticking, that the king would arrive, and with the king, the kingdom would naturally be established with the arrival of the king. And it was divided up into several parts. He said, first of all, seven weeks. Because this took place, the command to, to return was in 454 B.C. If you look 49 years from there, to, you get to 395 B.C. According to the Scripture, according to Usher's history and everything else, that is when Malachi concluded his letter, his prophecy, and that was the close of what we call the Old Testament canon. So after seven weeks plus another 62 weeks, then after that entirety of 69 weeks, the Messiah, the Prince, is going to arrive. And ladies and gentlemen, on the very day that God said it would happen, if you take 69 Jewish years and you multiply it times 360 days, which is what it took to make a Jewish year, and you did the math, Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem Fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah 9, 9. Behold, here comes your king. He's coming humbly, bringing salvation, riding on a, riding on a donkey's colt, coming over the Mount of Olives. Hey, there's your king. On the very day, this Jesus of Nazareth came riding over the Mount of Olives on the colt of a donkey. Jesus made what we call his triumphal entry. But Daniel also foretold that the Messiah would be cut off. That word karat, it means sacrificed, but not for something that he had done. Ladies and gentlemen, understand this, and this is very important. Jesus made a bona fide offer of the kingdom to Israel on the day they should have been expecting him exactly 173,880 days uh, from, the, from the commencement of this timeline. But the Jews rejected their king and crucified him. Folks, he had to be crucified. He had to be sacrificed as the Lamb of God. So on one hand, this had to be Jesus, the Lamb of God, had to die for the sins of Israel. And as John said, Said, not for our sins only, 1 John 2, 2, but for the sins of who? The entire world. 
God knew that it would happen, and he prophesied of it in Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, Daniel 9, and other places. So the sacrifice had to happen, but Israel had no justification for rejecting her promised king. It was simply unbelief. One of the reasons why the church age is hidden in the Old Testament is that Israel couldn't say, well, look there, we had to reject Jesus. Otherwise, the church age wouldn't come in. No, there was no justification for Israel's rejection. It was simply unbelief. By the way, they were judged for it. Look what Jesus said as he wept coming into Jerusalem. And when he was coming near, he saw the city and he wept over it saying, Oh, if you'd known even the least of thy day, the things which belong to you, everything, the promises that belong to you, but now they are hidden from thine eyes. For in the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies will build a trench around Jerusalem and surround the city of Jerusalem on every side. And they're going to bulldoze Jerusalem and destroy the city and take the children from within and not leave one stone upon another. Why? Because you didn't recognize the signs of the times. Folks, does prophecy matter? Oh, I think so. Jerusalem should have recognized the signs of the times. They didn't. Go on. And there shall be, by the way, this is the old Jericho Road coming down the Mount of Olives. This road leads to Bethany. They would have been on this road coming from Bethany that Jesus would have been riding, coming into Jerusalem or walking, coming into Jerusalem. And he said this, there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all Gentile nations, and Jerusalem shall be under the foot of Gentile control until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Remember we just referenced the time of the Gentiles as defined in Daniel chapter 9 just a moment ago. Daniel is told more. We see that the temple is destroyed by the people of the prince who shall come at some point in the future, according to verse 26. So what we've seen so far is that there were 69 weeks from the starting point until the Messiah would be cut off and the temple was destroyed. So that means, do your math, and don't do common core math, how many weeks are left? One. Very good, kids. Obviously, you all went to school prior to 1970. All right. So we still have this 70th week, seven years hanging out there. And the 70th week will begin when the prince that shall come establishes a covenant or a pact or a treaty or perhaps a trade agreement or something along those lines for one week, seven years. But in the middle of this final week, the sacrifices, in other words, the sin offerings and the uh, thanksgiving offerings, sacrifice and oblations will cease. Well, folks, if they cease in the middle of this week, that that means that they have to be reestablished. Now, let me tell you this. We don't have time to look at it because I am trying to be sensitive to the time. But according to Zechariah number 6, chapter 6, when the Messiah comes, he's going to rebuild the temple. So, over the period of time, this temple is going to be rebuilt over these first three and a half years of this seven-year period. And the Jews are going to think everything's copacetic, everything is good. Then all of a sudden, in the middle of this seven-year seven period, the sacrifices and oblations cease. And all hell breaks loose, as Daniel describes, as Jesus references in his Olivet Discourse, when you see the abomination of desolation. By the way, that word abomination refers to idolatry generally and the practices related to it. The abomination desolates God's holy place as spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Well, what is that? When you see him stand in the holy place, then you'll know what's going on. Paul said this, one of these days, hey, don't worry, the tribulation ain't happened yet. It's not gonna happen until the Holy Spirit be removed. And that man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalting himself about all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Once again, the abomination of desolation. All hell is going to break loose for the last three and a half years. It is literally going to get progressively worse and worse and worse and worse. How long is three and a half years? Well, that's 42 months. Revelation. John writes this, 42 months. John writes this, 42 months, time and time again. It's the same period of time. So in the last days, 
immediately before the Messiah comes again. This time, as he comes, it's going to be as king of kings, and every eye shall see him, and the Gentile nations shall mourn and not celebrate when they see him, according to the Olivet Discourse. Before this period of time, there should be this seventh, 70th week, a seven-year reign of the last global dictatorship and oligarchy of these toes in Daniel 2, also referred to as ten horns in Daniel 7 and in Revelation 17. And in all places, those toes and horns are identified as kings who will rule the earth through their front man, this super politician who becomes Satan's superman midway through this last seven years of judgment on Israel called the 70th week of Daniel. Now, folks, understand this. Man's nature has not changed at all over 6,000 years. It doesn't matter that we've got automobiles and cars, our automobiles and air conditioning and indoor plumbing and all the technology, handheld computers that like this, like this. I mean, it doesn't matter that we've got all this. We are still the same sinful, covetous, greedy, untrustworthy lot of people. And man has always had a desire to rule the world, beginning with Nimrod in Gen Genesis chapter 10 and going all the way through the last century when we clearly saw the example of Adolf Hitler, all with a desire to rule the world. Why? I don't know. I don't want to rule the world. I just want to be left alone be able to go play golf. <laughs> But it began with that first global empire, Babylon, which, by the way, was a single nation ruling the world, followed by two nations working together, Media Persia, joined together to rule the world, followed by Greece, one nation ruling the world, followed by Rome, one nation ruling the world. But this last empire as a confederation of ten kings. And the Hebrew word is malach. It's not kingdoms. It's a different word. It's kings. So I don't believe that these are ten geographical regions. They could be. I don't believe that these are ten specific countries. It could be. But I actually lean towards, and again, right at the top of your notes, Acts 17, 11, you make sure that I'm right. Because of the terminology that's used here of these as kings, I see this as a confederation of ten George Soros's, Bill Gates, Rothschilds, Rockefellers, these supermen that you don't see in the headlines that are working behind the scenes. As a matter of fact, as we will get into, as time allows in future weeks, in Daniel chapter 7, it says these ten will take another, an eleventh, and put him out front as the front man. And he will be the focus. He will be the super politician. But as things go along, there's some disagreement as the miry clay and iron don't mix together. There's a lot of debate, a lot of discussions. There wasn't an absolute monarchy. There are ten guys working together that all wanted to be the chief, and they put their front man that's supposed to be working for them, and all of a sudden, Mr. Fancy Pants got to be Mr. Big Pants. And three of them said, hey, we need to get rid of this guy, but those three were taken out. The other seven came into agreement real quickly, and something supernatural happens midway through where this guy becomes the absolute dread sovereign leading this last global empire. They will have a short run, seven years. Now, folks, that doesn't include the period of time of their buildup. I think there's a lot of things happening right now in preparation for that period of time. But we certainly are not in that period of time. Now, there are yet two periods not immediately obvious at first glance in Daniel 9, 26, and 27. One, between the Messiah being cut off and the destruction of the temple. Now, we know historically that there was a period of time of approximately 37 or 38 years between them, but it's not shown in this verse. 
As a matter of fact, there's no punctuation in the Hebrew. This just goes straight through. By the way, there were no verse markings and chapter markings. This was just a, a letter that was being written. Uh, so we see Messiah be cut off, but not for himself and the people of the princess. So this period of time, we know there's 37, 38 years there, but it doesn't show in the text. And there is also a period of time between the destruction of the temple, which occurs after the Messiah is cut off, but before the offerings and oblations are obviously restarted and then stopped as the temple is desecrated, as he demands to be worshipped, this period of time is where we are now living. And just like this one is not seen in the Scripture, neither is this one seen in the Scripture. Because remember, the church age was hidden in the Old Testament. By the way, Jesus hinted of this very age when he showed up in Jerusalem early in his ministry and he was in the synagogue. He grew up in as a boy. He asked for the scroll and the actual period of passage of Scripture that happened to be that week's reading was from Isaiah 61. And as Jesus read... He read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the year of salvation, the acceptable year of the Lord. He is in mid-sentence. It goes on to say, And the day of vengeance of our God then to comfort all those that mourn. And then we see evidences of the promised millennial kingdom down here. Jesus stopped in mid-sentence, rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the chief rabbi of the synagogue, and then looked at everybody and said, Today, this has been fulfilled right before your very eyes. Folks understand what he was saying when he stopped right there. Jesus, in his first advent, came humbly bringing salvation. The day of vengeance of our God is when God judges, pours out His wrath in that 70th week in order to establish His kingdom, which is talked about right here. So this period right here is also inferred by Jesus' action by rolling up the scroll and stopping there and saying, this part's done, this part, uh-uh, I'm not here yet. That's the second advent. That's consistent with this period of time in Daniel 9, 26. Is everybody still with me? Yeah. All right, very good. Now, check me out later. Go ahead. I just want to make sure I haven't lost anybody. And this same period of time is inferred when the prophet Zechariah writes about two times the king, the Messiah. That, that's king. The anointed one, the king, the anointed king, appears in Jerusalem. And they are obviously very different. So either Zechariah was really confused as what he was talking about, or he was talking about two different messiahs showing up, or as we know, there's one messiah who's going to come twice. Zechariah 9 9 says, Hey, your king's coming. Rejoice, daughter of Zion. Shout for joy, O daughter of Jerusalem. Your king comes unto you. He is just, he's bringing salvation. Humbly riding upon an ass and upon a colt the foal of an ass. Then, just a few chapters later, behold, the day of the Lord is coming. See this right here? The day of vengeance of our God. The day of the Lord, same time period, folks, is coming. And thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations. How many is all? Would that include the United States of America? Folks, let me tell you, after the rapture, America, you see how screwed up we are right now. That's with us here. After the rapture, what's left of America will goose step right into the, the ideas of world government without any hindrance. All nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall be in captivity, and what's left of the people shall not be cut off. They'll be trapped. Then... The Lord shall go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Think of Jericho. That's when the Lord was leading the battle plans. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Folks, the king's coming. Hey, folks, the king's coming. Boy, those are two very different arrivals, are they not? And in between these two events 
although it's not shown in the Old Testament, is the age in which we are now living. Again, the church age was hidden in the Old Testament. And I told you why it had to be hidden. The Jews couldn't point to it and say, hey, we've got to reject Jesus so the church can come about. No, they were just unbelievers. They rejected Jesus. And they got, unfortunately, unfortunately, they got what, well, I don't want to say it. Unfortunately, it was just, it was just unfortunate. How's that? I'll leave it at that. All right. Jesus first mentioned this idea in Matthew chapter 13. His mysteries, what does mystery mean when you're talking about prophecy? A previously unrevealed truth. Jesus preached a sermon we call the mysteries and the parables of the kingdom of heaven. Talks about what's going to be going on during this period of time of the church age. What's going to look like? It says, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. So the things Jesus was talking about had been secret up until then. Paul, writing about the church to the Ephesians, said, hey, let me reveal to you this mystery, which in other ages wasn't known unto the Son of Man, as is now revealed unto us by his apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles, what's the mystery? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. By the way, that's why the church age is invisible or not appear in Daniel chapter 2. Because the church was not revealed in the Old Testament. This period between Zechariah 9.9 and Zechariah 14.1. Now, let me ask you a question. By the way, we are about to stop. We're going to tie things together to today and what we're dealing with. And I think you're going to enjoy this. And by the way, we are not finished. We are just beginning. We are going to be searching the Scripture for answers and trying to tie together what we see going on and be able to warn the world of dangers and obviously, first and foremost, point people to Jesus because I believe that the hour is late and I believe the rapture is soon. Was Babylon a literal kingdom? Was it on earth? Was it a physical kingdom? Yeah? Was uh, Media Persia a literal kingdom on earth as a physical kingdom? Okay? Was Greece a literal kingdom on earth as a physical kingdom? Was Rome a literal kingdom on earth as a physical kingdom? Then would it be safe to conclude or to assume, if you like that word better, that this period of time coming where the ten Malek kings have a brief period of rule with their super politician out in front who winds up taking control of everything, Does, is it logical to say that that would be a material, physical kingdom on the planet? Okay? And then also, this stone cut out without hands that fills the earth. By the way, a mountain in prophecy means a kingdom. So this kingdom, which fills the earth with the Messiah leading it, ruling and reigning from Jerusalem, is it logical in this context that that also would be a earthly, physical kingdom? I think so. Now, we're about to wrap up. Recognize this. In Scripture, there is no warning of the rapture. The rapture comes like a thief in the night, and no man knows the exact day or the exact hour. And in the rapture, Jesus doesn't set foot on planet earth. Paul said, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And then you saw what I showed you a moment ago in Zechariah 14, which is what Jesus told me. Every sign that we see in Scripture is pointing to the second coming which is when Jesus sets foot on the Mount of Olives at the Battle of Armageddon. Every sign talked about in Matthew chapter 24 and other places are concerning the second coming, where Jesus comes in power, in glory, in the midst of a great war, and there is literally hell to pay. As in some areas, Revelation 19 tells us, blood will flow to the depth of the horse's bridle. 
Isaiah talks about Jesus behaving as a grape stomper and says when he shows up at Armageddon, he's going to already have blood-stained garments as he's coming from Edom. But we don't have time to talk about that this morning. But there are three signs that will tell us that we are in the end times. That say rapture? No. It says second coming. By the way, I believe the rapture is seven years before the second coming. So the rapture, some people believe in mid-trib. You have every right to be wrong. That's okay. But, but anyway, either way, the rapture is actually closer than the second coming. But all the signs are pointing, not to the rapture, but to the second coming. The rapture comes first. We're caught up to be with the Lord in the air. Then the time of Jacob's trouble, the 70th week of Daniel poured out on planet earth. And then at the end, Jesus literally comes back. We come back with him, according to Revelation 19. Now, what do we see? Well, we see that Israel is back in their land. That's one of the signs. And after 2,000 years, on May the 14th, 1948, Israel was reconstituted as a nation, literally born in a day. We know that, according to the prophet Zechariah, Jerusalem will be a controversial city over which the entire world is arguing over. Well, we see that happening. And then... The movement towards a global confederacy or government. Folks, the first global empire was in Genesis 11. What did God do to it? He intentionally divided the power. You talking about separation of power? Why? Because man's wicked. In fact, it, said, it says in, in Genesis that, hey, God came down, observed what was going on, said, man united together, there's going to be nothing to check his wickedness. I've got to divide them change their languages, and separate them. By the way, that's what God said to begin with. When they came off the ark, it said, fill the earth. What did they do? They went to the plains of Shinar, built a ziggurat, worshiping the host of heaven, and unified to make a name for themselves. Boy, you couldn't disobey God any more directly than what they were doing. And God divided their power. Hey, for some reason, God likes sovereign nations. Paul on Mars Hill said this, that God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined God has determined the times before appointed and the boundaries of their habitation. The psalmist said, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Hey, folks, we can extend God's blessings in America. Hey, I want us to be free. I want us to be a godly nation. I want us to have common sense that we recognize there's only two genders. I want some normal. And it's at that point that I'm hoping the Lord comes. I don't want to be judged first. Personally, maybe you like that. But I don't. But understand, we can delay God's hand. If you need an example, look at Jonah and Nineveh. Nineveh was within 40 days of destruction. And they lasted another century. Why? Because they repented. And eventually, God did have to kick them. But they got another century out of it. But notice, God likes sovereign nations during our dispensation, during the millennial reign. There will still be nations. And even amazingly, in the new heaven and the new earth, in Revelation 21, 24, it says the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor to it, this being the new Jerusalem. Understand this. The world is moving towards global government with both Republican and Democratic presidents participating. George H.W. Bush, a Republican, was the first one that coined the phrase New World Order. President Clinton furthered it by trade agreements which weakened America and American business, and immigration policy which favored bringing Muslims into America and diluting what had been one nation under the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Barack Obama increased that policy. He traveled the world apologizing for American exceptionalism he socialized our health care system, which we won't, we will talk about these things. We will talk about the threat of communism and how ungodly it is. And now they like to use the term global citizens. I'm proud to be an Okie. 
And folks, all of this has been progressing nicely because America is the one stumbling block. But all of this has been progressing nicely and America is coming along and then there was one fly in the ointment that wanted to make America great again. And he stuck his thumb in the eye of communist Red China, said, we're going to secure our borders because you're not a nation if you don't have definable borders. He recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. He rewrote trade deals to favor us instead of other countries. He withheld money from the United Nations and by the way, remember when one of our presidents said, oh, those manufacturing jobs will never come back to America again. He brought manufacturing back to America. I would rather have something made in America than made in China. And understand this, Chinese people are just people created by God and they need a savior. But the red Chinese government is evil. Communism is wicked. And don't be surprised when they lie to us. Of course they're going to lie to us. The ends justify the means in communism. And President Trump was on the road with our economy humming at a rate that we have never seen. We have the lowest unemployment among all races ever in American history. Our economy was rolling stronger than it's ever been in American history, and he was on the road to a landslide re-election. And they had tried everything to stop it, making up all sorts of stories, all sorts of inquiries, nothing that had any evidence to back it up. Hey, you were guilty just on accusation. We don't need any evidence. Forget this presumption of innocence. You're guilty. And he still was standing strong, and still we we're heading towards re-election, and we we're going to continue to, to, to uh, bring business away from China. Hey, I don't want my medicine made in China. And quite frankly, I don't want to be put on some sort of life-saving machine that was made in China. I don't trust it. And all of a sudden, out of communist red China, we have this virus which has destroyed all the economies of the world and has done more to advance socialism in America than FDR ever did. In only six weeks. Now we're done here. We're going to pick up at a future date. I don't know whether I'm preaching next week or Dan, but we're going to continue. We're just, hey, we're just examining. Was this simply an accident? I don't know. Doesn't look like it. Was it intentional? Boy, it sure has had an effect on the, on the world. If your desire is to bring the world together under global government, man, we've made a lot of strides in six weeks. Let me ask you this. Who was behind it? Well, we found out that you can't trust the Communist Red Chinese Party for honest medical information. Let me ask you this. Can you trust the intent of doctors that are associated with the World Health Organization. Folks, I've got a problem when I've got the same doctors a few weeks ago saying, oh, you don't need to wear a mask. And then they come out a couple of weeks later and say, oh, by all means, you should wear a mask. Well, why didn't you tell us that earlier? <laughs> well, we were short on masks. And we needed our emergency personnel to have them first. So you're telling me you were lying to us two weeks ago. But I'm supposed to trust you now. I'm sorry, I may step in it once, but I'm going to make sure I don't step in it again. In Matthew 24, everything there, all of these things you'll hear, again, this is pointing to the second coming. Rapture is going to come earlier, either three and a half years or seven years. We'll talk about that in future weeks. 
You shall hear wars, rumors of wars. Don't be troubled. All these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines. Boy, I hope we don't have one. I've never seen a day except around tornado season where I go in and see shelves empty in our grocery stores. Boy, I don't like what's going on here. There should be famines. There should be pestilences. COVID-20, COVID-21, earthquakes, diverse places. Well, is that the tribulation yet? No, all these are the beginning of birth pains. Folks, there's going to be a confederation of ten oligarchs who put forth a super politician that we're all going to, are supposed to trust as the front man as they integrate global government. So as we leave today, be wary of those who call for more global control. Be wary whenever you hear the term global citizens. Be wary of the world anything. The World Health Organization. I got to tell you, I trust my local doctor that I've lived with the last 40 years in the same community a whole lot more than I trust Dr. Fauci or Dr. whoever else out there. Personally, that's just me. By the way, have you noticed they're testing with drones that can track you in your social distancing? By the way, why is 10 a magic number? Why is 9 safe to get together, but 11, you're putting your life in danger? You know what? If there's only two of us and the other guy is sick, then I'm going to get sick. But there could be a hundred of us. And if we're not sick, we don't have anything to worry about. And what makes six feet so special? I read something, I saw something on television the other day that a sneeze goes 24 feet. Well, I'm six feet away, and if you sneeze on me, I'm still toast. And by the way, if we're walking and we're keeping social distance, when you breathe out and I walk, I'm breathing in. And in New York, you can't meet for church because if you got 10 together, you could put your lives at risk. However, feel free to take the subway and just squeeze 100 people in there into a confined box and breathe each other's air for a while. Nothing to worry about there. Folks, I've got to tell you, this just doesn't make sense to me. By the way, Sweden did nothing. South Dakota did nothing. Boy, they're doing great. Talking about having chips inserted in us. Talking about having us carry cards with forced vaccinations and having to have proof of being vaccinated. But understand, this, we're not forcing this. This is for your safety. This is for your well-being. Oh, remember the serpent's words. Oh, Eve, don't you know <laughs> this is a good thing. If you eat of the fruit, you'll be just like God. Over the next few weeks, we're going to study. We're going to learn more. Folks, Reagan said, trust but verify. I listen to everything but verify everything that you hear. Folks, here's this. Let me just say this. Are you ready? Hey, I see all this stuff. I, it seems to me like we're coming together towards a desire for global. And we, we know this, the United Nations. Well, this has been going on for half a century. We, in fact, longer than that, we know this. We know this. We're seeing greater evidence of it. I have been amazed at how quickly we have been willing to give up our unalienable rights for our safe. You know what unalienable means? It means it can't be taken away. It's God-given. Hey, you might lose your liberty if you break the law, but you can't be under house arrest when you haven't done anything and aren't sick. The government cannot just arbitrarily close down your business and, and inhibit your pursuit of happiness. But we aren't thinking. Why? Because, oh, we're doing it for your safety and well-being. Oh, here, just take, we need to identify you. We're just going to put a simple mark on your forehead. 
or on your hand. That way, we don't have to reach for your wallet, but we'll be able to recognize who's been vaccinated and who's not, and you'll be able to come in and buy and sell. Uh, boy, I tell you what, scares me to death when I see people coming in and having their temperature taken on their foreheads. I know Dr. Holson's probably wanting to shoot me because he thinks that's a good idea because he's a doctor. He's concerned about our well-being, but you know what? I, I know that there is a role of self-government involved here that's been completely usurped. And we have given away our unalienable rights without a fight because it's for our safety. Well, count me amongst those that are just a tad bit suspicious. But understand this. The rapture could come at any point in time. There's no, nothing that needs to be fulfilled. Last days, Israel back in the land, Jerusalem a cup of trembling, calls for global government. We know that the rapture is going to take place either three and a half years, as some believe, or seven years before the second coming. So that means that all the signs are pointing to the 70th week of, of Daniel and ultimately the second coming at the Battle of Armageddon. We know the rapture is before then. It could be today. Are you ready? Are you ready?